I'm Zachary Elwood, and this is the People Who Read People podcast. This is a podcast about examining and understanding human behavior. You can learn more about it at my website, behaviorpodcast.com. That's behavior-podcast.com. In a pretty large study done in 2017, 40% of people polled either agreed with or did not disagree with the following statement. When I think about our political and social institutions, I cannot help thinking, just let them all burn. Also, 40% of those polled either agreed with or did not disagree with the following statement. We cannot fix the problems in our social institutions. We need to tear them down and start over. These are some of the pretty startling findings of a research project done by Michael Bang Peterson, Matthias Osmundson, and Kevin Arsenault, where they surveyed more than 6,000 people in the U.S. and in Denmark a country considered less polarized than the United States. They labeled a certain level of these destructive and antisocial mindsets a, quote, need for chaos. In the U.S. study, these feelings were found across the political spectrum and were not correlated with a specific left or right type of ideology. While these feelings were significantly high in Trump supporters, they were also pretty high in Bernie Sanders supporters. And presumably, they were also present for people who can be hard to put in political categories. In today's episode, I'll be interviewing Kevin Arsenault, one of the Need for Chaos researchers, about this work. We talk about what it is that might be creating those mindsets, what the factors might be. The title of their paper was The Need for Chaos and Motivations to Share Hostile Political Rumors. I'll read from their paper's abstract now. Why are some people motivated to share hostile political rumors, such as conspiracy theories and other derogatory news stories? Previous research mostly focuses on the thesis that people's partisan identities motivate them to share hostile political rumors as a way to tarnish their political opponents. In this manuscript, we demonstrate disruptive psychological motivations also play an important but often overlooked role in the spread of hostile rumors. We argue that many individuals who feel socially and politically marginalized are motivated to circulate hostile rumors because they wish to unleash chaos to burn down the entire established political order and the hope they can gain status in the process, end quote. When I heard about this study, I was intrigued because I thought it helped explain a lot of behavior I see these days from people across the political spectrum. A lot of the mainstream focus this study has received has been about how it helps explain Trump supporters. For example, a New York Times op-ed about this study had the headline, The Trump Voters Whose Need for Chaos Obliterates Everything Else. In that piece, it only briefly mentioned how the need for chaos was also significant for Bernie Sanders supporters. If you're a liberal listening to this, hopefully as you're listening to the upcoming interview, you're not just going, yeah, those crazy Trump supporters. Hopefully you spend some time considering how these chaotic worldviews may be present on the liberal side for some people, how there's been a pretty evident and substantial burn it all down mentality amongst many on the liberal side. And similarly, if you're a Trump supporter listening to this interview, Hopefully, you're willing to challenge yourself and examine how Trump himself can be perceived by many as emblematic of chaotic and antisocial tendencies, in how abusively and recklessly he behaves and talks, and how he has constantly tried to divide everyone into us and them since before even taking office. One of the key aspects of how polarization dynamics play out is that we tend to not question our own side and give them a pass on things. In psychology, this is called in group favoritism, the in group being our own group, our tribe. And at the same time, we also filter everything about the other side through the least generous, most pessimistic lens. This is called outgroup bias. If you'd like to learn more about these dynamics, I recommend listening to an interview I did of Jennifer McCoy about polarization dynamics and how they get worse. If your goal is to try to understand how these polarizing us versus them dynamics play out and how they ramp up, it's important to try to see things from a more removed and objective vantage point to try to eliminate your in-group favoritism and outgroup bias. And one step in doing that is to attempt to see your own side as your political opponents view it. To take a specific example here, if you're a liberal and you can see the perspective that a good number of people on the left do have some pretty antisocial and destructive views, if you can admit that there are some very bad takes that conservatives are seeing, you can better see how the perception of such things is what drives the anger and animosity of those on the right. In the same way, a liberal person's perceptions of the worst aspects of conservative people is what can drive anger and animosity on the liberal side. Attempting to see these alternative points of view help us better see how there can be people on both sides who use these us versus them, good versus evil framings, and help us better understand how these behaviors can ramp up tensions. 
Trying to get that vantage point also makes you more capable of making points in a way that speaks to the other side. It should go without saying, but each political group contains a wide variety of people with a wide variety of beliefs. In other words, not everyone is as bad as the worst person in that group. Some liberal people listening to this may be thinking, no, Trump supporters are horrible, they're racist, they can't be reasoned with. If you're thinking that, I'd like you to remember that about 10% of black voters voted for Trump in 2020, and about a third of Muslim voters voted for him, and that these percentages increased significantly from 2016, and that many analysts think the anti-police and anti-prison type slogans, and the militant protests and riots, and the people on the liberal side acting as if those things weren't a big deal, all played a role in minority support for Trump growing. And if you can understand how there can be black and other minority Trump supporters, then you can maybe also understand how it's possible to be a white Trump supporter and not be motivated by racism or xenophobia. I personally know some white Trump supporters and Trump apologists who don't understand these framings. And while I disagree with them in their support for Trump, I do see their point of view in that regard and see how being unfairly maligned drives the us versus them polarization dynamics for them. Put another way, it's important to separate our perceptions about who we see as the worst and most malicious leaders from our perceptions about our fellow citizens. While I dislike Trump as much as anyone and believe that he might be the cause in the near future of the United States becoming a failed democracy, I also draw a big line between my beliefs about Trump and my beliefs about a randomly chosen Trump supporter. I know a lot about Trump. I don't know a lot about that randomly chosen Trump supporter. And in fact, I believe many Trump supporters are fine people. And even if you think that the other side is very wrong, we should be able to recognize that humans can be fooled and misled in various ways, and that that doesn't make those people horrible or crazy people. For example, believing that the 2020 election was stolen doesn't make you a white supremacist or an evil person, which are both framings I regularly see from liberals. To me, belief that the election was rigged only indicates to me that you were successfully misled by some pretty powerful people and media sources. But even this rather basic level of generosity and empathy, acknowledging that our fellow citizens are fallible, seems missing for so many people these days. On both the left and the right, there seems to be a percentage of people who are very unreasonable and antisocial, who have this so-called need for chaos or something close to it. And maybe it's possible we're letting the most unreasonable people on both sides have undue influence on our public discussions and online discussions. In my talk with Kevin coming up, we talk about how the internet gives a lot of power to the most destructive voices. Some people listening to what I've been talking about so far may be thinking, these are false equivalencies. Obviously, one side is way worse. But I'm definitely not debating that. Obviously, we all have our thoughts about which side is worse. But we're talking about individuals here. We're talking about psychology at an individual level. The matter of who started it or which side is worse isn't relevant if our goal is understanding why individual people behave the way they do or what we ourselves might do to help or hinder things. And I think one big factor here, as polarization grows and as we perceive more and more people around us to be unreasonable and horrible, the more our own antisocial tendencies grow. When we perceive a large swath of our fellow citizens to be horrible people, to be beyond redemption, the more we can understandably have an urge to burn it all down. Because when you perceive the world that way, your love for humanity withers. You see less and less worth saving. I'd also argue that your love for yourself and your own life also withers because we are humanity and humanity is us. And I think these effects are also being amplified by the fact that modern society seems to increasingly be isolating us and making us more lonely. If these ideas are correct, then the need for chaos amongst our population is likely growing as polarization grows. And maybe that means in order to avoid worst case outcomes, we need more people willing to work on things that take some effort and some courage. Hating the other side is easy. It's the path of least resistance. What's much harder is attempting to understand others' points of view, attempting to see things from their point of view, and being willing to have conversations and listen and not presume the worst about your fellow citizens. I'm sorry about this very long introduction. I think these things are very important, and I think they're connected to my and Kevin's need for chaos conversation. Here's a little bit more about Kevin Arsenault. He's currently a professor of political science at Sciences Po Paris, Center for Political Research. He's been a professor of political science with the Institute for Public Affairs and director of the Behavioral Foundations Lab at Temple University. He studies how people make political decisions, paying particular attention to the effects of psychological biases. A book that he co-authored was called Taming Intuition, How Reflection Minimizes Partisan Reasoning 
and promotes democratic accountability. And that book took a look at why people vary in their ability to get beyond their biases. Another book he was co-author of was Changing Minds or Changing Channels, Partisan News in an Age of Choice. And that book studied how people's partisan biases shape the influence of political media. And of course, Kevin was a researcher on the Need for Chaos Research Project. Okay, here's the interview with Kevin Arsenault, recorded July 22nd, 2021. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me, Zach. Yes, yeah, so maybe we can start with, can you talk a little bit about what the interest was, what the motivations were for you and the other researchers when you were thinking about researching these hostile political rumors? It started all right after the 2016 election. And Michael and Matthias and I were sitting around. Uh, I remember I actually traveled to Denmark for a kind of a collaboration meeting where we were trying to figure out how to get our heads around what had just happened uh, in, the, in social media and how a lot of rumors, fake news spread during uh, the 2016 election. And we didn't think that the whole story was that this was just another outgrowth of partisan polarization and partisan, cheer, uh, partisan cheerleading. We thought that there was something a bit deeper going on. Um, and really, this whole project um, has its roots in trying to understand um, or, or, or you know, reaction to, if you will, the events of the 2016 election. And are there objective indicators that show those kinds of things increasing? I, I know we all have our sense that those things are increasing, but are there objective indicators? That's really hard uh, to answer. The, I guess the easy answer is not any, in my mind, credible or reliable ones, because it's a difficult thing to, to chart over time. So if you think about even looking at, say, you know, there is work, for instance, on you know, the spread of false and, and true you know, stories and news on, on social media, especially Twitter, Vosagu, Roy, and uh, uh, Aral are probably the most um, you know, famous folks to have, to have looked at this question. And so they look at, say, Twitter from 2006 to 2017, I believe. And, but even that, right, they, they don't make claims about whether it's rising or, or not, because mm. how many people are on these social networks has also uh, grown over this time. So it's hard to know, you know, even if you did see an increase, it's hard to know, is it just because there's more people there or the composition of the folks that are there has changed in some way? I think the only thing that we can say is that whether or not it's grown or not, the ability for rumors and fake news to travel across, you know, quickly across networks, that power has increased with social media. And as social media becomes, uh, you know, broader and more uh, embedded in our lives, that ability has also increased. Mm -hmm. Is it accurate to say that our study of the internet and social media, how we communicate on there is still in its infancy, just because it's so hard to get a handle on these things and they change so quickly? Absolutely. I mean, and, and it's funny to say that because we've, we've been studying the internet. The internet's not new in a sense, right? We've been studying it for 20 years, but social media is relatively new and i think that the work on it is much better than it was say 10 years ago um, but we, we are still getting um, our heads around it because the platforms themselves and the technology and how we engage with it are continuing to you know unfold and change before our eyes mm -hmm. yeah it just seems there's so much uh disparity in thought about this you know you, uh, i interviewed jamie settle who researched and wrote a book about how facebook seems to amplify polarization and then you have levi boxel who i also interviewed saying like it doesn't seem that big a factor and I, I think at the end of the day it's these things are still very much in the beginning stages of being understood and the wild thing is just how big an impact they seem to have and how little we understand the impact. Yeah. That, that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, Jamie's, you mentioned Jamie's, uh, Jamie Settle's book. Right now at this point, I think it, it sort of stands as the, the strongest and, and deepest reflection on this by providing, I think, a, a theoretical framework in which to sort of understand how people engage with social media. But, you know, it's still, even with that, we still are, uh, funny enough, in a position where we're inundated with data. I mean, mm -hmm. Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, they all, you know, there's so much data, we don't even know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we're still grappling with how to understand um, the sort of basic questions 
that like the one that you posed, you know, it's almost like if it would just, if the, if the situation would stay static for a while, then you could <laughs> get a handle of it, but it's, it, it all changes so rapidly. Yeah. That, that is the problem with studying technology, right? It, yeah. it, it by its, the, the nature of the beast is that it's a moving target. Yeah. That, I thought Settle's book was so great. I think the interesting thing there is how little that work is known. I mean, I think it's largely confined to academic areas and then That's people, right. will, people will run with, uh, you know, Levi Boxel's, uh, work and, and other work critical of, of social media impacts, but it's like, there's other academic work out there about, you know, the effects of social media and, and it, it, but it seems largely in the academic world. Well, thanks to folks like you, you know, uh, more people can learn about it. I mean, you know, the, uh, the, the problem with the academic world, if I can uh, criticize us for a bit is that, you know, we, we, it, and Jamie's book is written beautifully, but it is still written for an academic audience. And so I think a lot of people are you're choosing a book to read on an airplane it's probably not yeah. an academic one it's expensive it's big yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. um yeah let's get to your work now uh let's talk about your study and uh maybe you can talk about the gist if you could sum up in a few sentences what your your study involved well we were interested in understanding the psychological motivations for why people share what we call hostile political rumors. These are things that are negative and they're meant to be negative, directed at um, political opponents. We we're interested in what motivates people to share, not necessarily believe, but to share those, those items. Our work basically attempts to under, uncover uh, some of the psychological mechanisms that lead people to do that. And the sort of broad takeaway is that for many people, or I should probably say for some people, sharing things like fake news and, and hostile political rumors is driven by their desire for social status. And that one way in which they go about trying to gain that social status is by creating chaos. And uh, certainly sharing fake news and rumors and things like that are in, in a sense, a means to an end. And your, your study involved asking, basically polling many people and to give people a sense of the kinds of questions you ask people, I'll just read a few. Now, I get a kick when natural disasters strike in foreign countries, our social institutions are rotten to the core. I fantasize about a natural disaster wiping out most of humanity such that a small group of people can start all over. I think society should be burned to the ground. When I think about our political and social institutions, I cannot help thinking, just let them all burn. Uh, so you ask questions like this, then you rated people's, you know, agreement or disagreement with them. And, and I think you also, uh, in the U.S. at least, you you also collected information about the political side that they were m more aligned with. Is it, does that all sound accurate? That's exactly right. Can you can you talk a little bit about uh, the <laughs> the number of people that agreed with such statements? Well, well th thankfully... Um... The number of people that agreed, so I think we end up having 11 total statements um, we, with this scale. We, we end up, mo in most of the analyses that we run, uh, just look at um, kind of a, a summary of eight of the, uh, of the questions on this scale. If you asked, you know, how many people agreed with, uh, strongly agreed with all eight of these, it would be a very small number, you know, around mm -hmm. uh, you know, less than 5%. And, and that's, in, in some sense, you know, the, the good news. But if you look at the individual items here, we do find that there are um, a good slice uh, with, uh, of the sample, say somewhere between 10 and 15 percent, who do agree with uh, questions like, you know, when I think about our political and social institutions, I can't help thinking just let them burn, as well as the statements about starting over again. So... When we look at, at these questions and we do an analysis that actually kind of tries to put people into categories, what we find is that there is a group of people um, who are sort of high in what we call need for chaos. And, and these are folks that tend to strongly agree with all of these, um, these statements. And that's about, like I said, about 5%. But you have another group of people they don't ag agree with all of the statements that we have. So if, for instance, they don't they don't get a kick out of natural disasters, mm -hmm. but they do tend to agree with the ones about restarting society over again. And if you look at that slice of folks, it's closer to about um, about 
of our sample uh, that agree with those types of questions. So the way I would think about it, or the way I think about it in my own mind, is that this is um, a minority of folks um, who, who have these sentiments. They probably have them for different reasons. The folks that are um, have them for the most darker elements of this, so people who, who enjoy natural disasters, for instance, that's a small portion, thankfully, of the United States. But once you consider, um, you know, these sort of more, um, maybe less dark motivations for, for wanting chaos, you actually do have, we do see a substantial uh, or considerable minority of folks who, who might have these, these inclinations. Somebody described the results as staggering. And, you know, for example, the fact that 24% agreed that society should be burned to the ground. Were you surprised by how high these numbers were? Uh, definitely. And I, I think that, you know, if you look at question by question, there could be some reason that, that, that a lot of people like the particular question. But you should know um, that, that, you know, we, in a sense, did something that's a bit can, can be a bit um, risky and scary for academics. We, we created this scale ourselves. So it's usually the standard approach that you, you kind of stand on the shoulders of giants that have done things before you, which also gives you a little bit of cover to say, well, other people have, have vetted the scale. So we, a, a lot of the preliminary work that you don't even see in these papers was us just, just developing a scale that, that got at this um, characteristic that we call need for chaos. So, you know, I think that in the beginning of developing the scale, you know, um, I, I, could, I can remember my, uh, Michael and TSI sort of being like, you know, how many people are really going to be, are going to agree with these, these sorts of things? <laughs> and are they going to be just trolling us? Mm. And, you know, un unfortunately, after, you know, working on this for a couple of years, uh, sad to say, I am, I am a bit surprised by how many people are, are out there that feel this way and, um, and, aren't, just, uh, and aren't just trolling us. And, and I should I should note that all of this work happened before before the pandemic too. So you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which seemed to amplify some of those feelings. Yeah, you know, on both sides. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, th there's trolling, and then there's I think there's also the caveat of you know, for a lot of people, it can just be kind of cool to to or, or approve to say some of these things without really thinking about their meaning. You know, for example, you know, we cannot fix problems in our social institutions, we need to tear them down and start over. I mean, I, I know some liberal people who basically have a, will say things like burn it down. And I know that they don't actually believe that it's almost like just become an almost, you know, the, the, some of the meaning of that has been subtracted because of the things that have become so easy and common to say. So it, the, I think there's a little bit of that too. Absolutely. And so, you know, one of the things that we try to do in, in, in all of these studies is try to make sure that we weren't just picking up people who were just playing around or not being mm -hmm. uh, fully serious. Now, in doing so, that means that we, we do end up trying to sort of control for or remove those types of um, responses from our analysis. You know, what you do find is that there still remains um, some group of people who seem deadly serious about this. They mm -hmm. really do. I've been asked before in the past, is this a, an ideology? And I don't think it is an, an ideology, but I do think it is a form of nihilism that some people just seem to gravitate towards. I will say, uh, personally, I see that around me, like whether from conservatives or liberals, I, I have a sense of that growing from interacting with people I know and things I see in the world. I mean, that's why your your paper spoke so much to me. and I And I feel like a lot of people talk about the you know, they'll talk about the misinformation or the or the media, things like this. But I think it's missing the key point, which I think your study gets to, which is that there is this uh, growing uh, growing nihilism across the board for for a lot of people, and I, and I think that uh, your study captured that. The other thing you talked about, another limitation of the study, is that obviously the people that believe these things aren't necessarily going to go out and actively t try to destroy society, but it, it gives insight into how many of these people may be acting when they're alone in front of their computer and those actions, the, the actions on the internet, on social media now have very real effects. Is that, does that sum up your thinking in that area? That does. And I, and I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things that um, we try to keep right in our minds and when we communicate this to other people try to, to communicate is that we developed um, a framework for trying to understand how people behave in an online world. 
And so this, this isn't, you know, these sorts of feelings or attitudes towards society and, and, and nihilism can be a thing that kind of lives in a, in an online or sort of virtual environment. So well, we certainly don't have any evidence on, and, and therefore I wouldn't make any claims about whether or not this helps us understand uh, whether or not folks are going to say actually um, do something violent or join mm-hmm. a violent movement or something like that. And, and there are there are people who do study those things, and, and I do see some parallels with that work. But for the most part, I think we're really getting at uh, the kind of behavior that is more or less sort of contained in, you know, clicking and sending and mm-hmm. and basically engaging with people in a virtual environment. Yeah, one thing that comes to mind in that area is I had done a good amount of research into this. One of the most prolific fake news creators, domestic fake news creators in the U.S., and he went by the name of True Pundit, was an anonymous uh, fake news creator. And uh, he was pretty influential. He got shared. Uh, he, he had a lot of fake news about Hillary Clinton that was shared leading up to the 2016 election. I was this close to outing who he was, and uh, BuzzFeed beat me to him. I was actually <laughs> talking to the BuzzFeed journalist, and it turned out it was this guy named Michael Moore behind it. Not the Michael Moore not, not you're the, thinking yeah, of, the, but yeah, not not him. But it, it was a former journalist in Pennsylvania who kind of went off the deep end, who'd been arrested by the FBI for selling bootleg hockey DVDs and had a grudge against the system. His you know fake news creation was very influential. In my opinion, it was a key factor in Trump winning in 2016 because it, his fake news got shared by you know Donald Trump Jr., General Flynn, a lot of people in the right wing conservative world. And I thought it was a good example of how the behaviors of these disgruntled and angry people can have very real world effects. Yeah, they really can. And in the U.S. study that you did, you saw a a need for chaos, both high amongst Trump supporters, but also less so, but also amongst Bernie Sanders supporters. Was that right? That's correct. And, um, And we've actually sort of dug in a bit more in subsequent studies. And, and what you find is, is that um, there really is, does appear to be this measure need for chaos. It doesn't appear to neatly map onto uh, the left-right political divide as we mm-hmm. sort of think about it. There do seem to be people that are a bit more on the right that are high on this sort of need for chaos indicator, but not exclusively so. And there are plenty of people who are actually on the left. But there are also, I should say, plenty of people that don't really fit neatly into any of these uh, sort of political labels. And at best, you know, what we sort of, um, we basically did um, a, a follow-up study where we tried to understand their, the motivations of these folks who, who, are, who are high and need, need for chaos. And what we found was, is that they seem to be motivated not by a, a political ideology is usually um, something that's about a system for for a better society, right? Folks on the left and folks on the right, they disagree about what that is, but they believe that if you if government and society were to be organized in the way that's consistent with their belief system, it would be better for everybody. P- folks that are high in need for chaos really don't care about that. Instead, they're much more interested in systems um, being designed to benefit them and people like them. So their motivation is much more um, self-involved. It's much more selfish. Uh, you know, I think that also kind of fits with the, the, the nihilistic view of the world as well, which is it's, there's, the only thing that matters is me. Everything else is meaningless in yeah. a sense. Yeah, this might be getting into too broad philosophical area, but one thing I often think of is that there can be some aspects inherent in modern society that can induce some of these feelings you know for example modern society being pretty isolating like there's a high loneliness quotient Mm -hmm. uh we have less communal activities uh modern society is a bit sensory depriving and and boring which maybe makes people long for something more real some purpose some conflict And, and then that's not even taking into account you know actual uh inequality of how people can look around, even even if they're doing quite well, can look around and more easily see how people better than them are doing the people that are doing better than them financially. And I'm wondering if, you know, obviously we're in the very much opinion area here, but I'm wondering if some of those 
aspects of modern society in your mind cause some of these things? We actually have some evidence to sort of, um, you're right, the, the broader question uh, about society, we can't really, um, you know, uh, manipulate society. But what we do find is that when we try to understand the um, antecedents of the substrates that sort of lead people to develop um, higher levels of need for chaos. And one of the, the things that we see that, that go along with that, as you're mentioning, is loneliness, as well as a set of kind of dark personality traits. So it's not just loneliness by itself, but it's loneliness combined with the type of people who um, might be higher in um, what psychologists call um, dark psycholog psychological traits. This would be psychopathy, Machiavellianism, so the, the desire to manipulate other people to your ends, um, as well as narcissism. Mm. So, you know, these are folks that aren't, they're not people you necessarily want to have as your friends. And maybe for that reason, they, they don't have a whole lot of friends, so they feel pretty lonely and they feel pretty isolated. What's also interesting about that too, and I think it touches um, on this question about the role that society plays in, in here, is that folks that are high in need for chaos, they are actually... They, they tend to be lonely, they tend to be um, high and dark psychological traits, but they do not tend to be poor in a, in a, or, or, or um, deprived in a material sense. In fact, a lot of the, uh, if, if anything, folks that are high in need for chaos tend to be um, a bit more on the wealthier side, not rich, but not poor. Um, and I think that one of the things, uh, now this is where I'm going to get into opinion and speculation. One of the things that I think is going, that could be going on here is that you have folks who are not destitute, right? They feel like they have the material trappings of the type of people that should be, you know, well off and respected in society. But mm -hmm. for a set of, of reasons, real or imagined, they feel marginalized and slighted and not respected to the level that they feel like they should be in society. And this is what motivates them to sow chaos. They're angry about it, and uh, but they also don't have a whole. They don't have much of a moral compass that sort of reigns in how they deal with those feelings of marginalization. And as a result, they act in ways that are disruptive. And also, you know, if we're talking about social media effects, I mean, social media, how I see it is. The way it factors into a lot of these things is it allows us to be the worst versions of ourselves so easily, you know, whether it's online gambling or spreading hostile political rumors, it just basically gives us an easy path to doing these things that are either bad for us or bad for society. To clarify here, a little note, I meant being addicted to online gambling in a self-destructive way, not just engaging in online gambling. I could also have mentioned becoming addicted to online porn, becoming addicted to shopping, any number of things that the internet gives us an amazing power to indulge in. And you layer on top of that, that you get to, you get to create an avatar of who, of who you want to be on, on social media. So, you know, these are the same folks that, that, you know, if, if they actually were in the room talking to you, they might, they might behave in a very different mm -hmm. way, but online they can hide behind pseudonyms. They can um, basically construct a world in which they feel powerful and dominant. And, and I think you're, you're absolutely right. Social media um, provides folks in this position a way to kind of live a double life in a way that you didn't have before, you know? Yeah, and I'd say even for people that are not anonymous, it, the internet can be a pretty deranging and distorting place. And I think it, you know, that, that was one reason I researched and wrote my piece on some the inherent ways in which social media may be amplifying our divides because I see some, I, I think in a few years, we'll probably have a better sense of how deranging our interactions on social media can be because I see a lot of people, they'll get hate, they'll get anger from people. And that causes, that seems to cause them to behave in ways that are just completely unreasonable because being hated online, having angry interactions online is, can be very destabilizing. It, it makes us you know, short, short circuit our reason. And that can ca have cascading effects, I think, on how people behave. Yeah. I, I, I completely agreed with your um, article on that, actually. And I, I think you also layer on top of that, um, Chris Bale's work on um, this topic on polarization in social media. And, you know, you also layer on top of that, that 
most of us live in um, distorted social media, I should say, provides a distorted view of what people are saying and thinking and worried about because not just because of the algorithms, right, that, that um, select and sort what we see, but also because what we decide, what people decide to post um, on social media might be wildly different from what they would do if they, what they would say if they were at um, a dinner party or, mm -hmm. or talking with a friend. And so, of course, what happens is we get ourselves in this sort of um, vicious cycle where it's negative and you know, provocative content that gets, that gets attention. People who want attention and likes and clicks and retweets uh, then respond to that incentive. So then when we go on social media where we think everybody is unhinged, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then I think you're absolutely right, then we're in this context where people are yelling at us and we yell back at them. The, then, of course, you find you, you, the, the etiquette that then governs interactions, you know, polite interactions in face-to-face, -face, the face-to-face -face world fall apart when you're online, right? I mean, I don't have to watch the person in front of me cry because I tell them I hope mm -hmm. they get run over by a bus, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I say it. Yeah, and I think uh, while we're on the subject, I might as well throw in, I think the a lot of people point to, you know, Levi Boxel's study saying, showing that older Americans are more polarized, but I don't think, uh, and people use that to say like, well, obviously social media can't be a big influence, but having talked to Levi Boxel and, you know, just did some research on it and looked at other studies, I think it's it's still entirely possible that, I mean, nobody, I don't think anybody would say it's the the main driver. I think what the argument is that it's an amplifier. And I think even with the, yeah. the older people being more polarized, that there are other routes to that, uh, that could be due to theoretically due to social media, like the fact that, you know, for example, Fox News shares like the worst, uh, you know, the, the worst and most unreasonable takes from the left and, and uses that to rile up their audience, you know, things like that. Uh, there's still there's still mechanisms by which older people might be more disturbed by that kind of thing than younger people are. I, I think that's absolutely right. I think it's amplifier. I think also there's just, um, you know, a different understanding about how you should engage with social media. Um, and I think that, you know, older folks might tend to engage with uh, social media posts, or I know for a fact that there's evidence of this in a more literal way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas younger folks might see things in a more ironic or, or, exactly. or funny kind of thing. And so, and so they might see a, um, a hyperbolic post and kind of laugh at it. And so, you know, these things, I think um, these dynamics, really do kind of complicate, like, uh, it's hard to answer the question, what is the effect of social media, <laughs> right? Because it has different effects on different people for different reasons. Totally. You, you can see that every day in, in Facebook, seeing older people <laughs> overreact to something that's like, obviously a joke or just a joke. said to be <laughs> rile people up and younger people are just like, ah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, I feel like there's a tendency on the part of many on the liberal side to look at a study like yours and make simplistic deductions about this. Like, for example, they'll say, oh, well, that explains, you know, support for Trump. But I think they're mm -hmm. they're missing the fact that while there may be more of that on the, the Trump supporter side, A, many Trump supporters don't have these qualities and B, right. many people on the liberal side do have these do these qualities. Yeah. And to me, yeah. what is and, and I would say that in some in some respects, you know, people that are that that um, want to use or do use chaos as a way to to try to obtain their own uh, reputational ends. You know that they want to burnish their reputation or feel better about themselves, you know, essentially. And they do this by trolling and and um, spreading lies and rumors and, and as well as trying to provoke others. That's always been with us. Um, social media makes that uh, gives those folks. Um, a platform that allows them to do this on a grander scale than before. Trump, uh, especially in 2016, Donald Trump was a was a perfect, if you will, weather vane in the sense it allowed them they could basically harness his candidacy to play with and troll and 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 have a lot of fun in a sense. I mean, folks that are high need for chaos, they tell us that the two reasons that they like to spread hostile political rumors isn't because they believe them per se, but mm -hmm. because they think it'll help them obtain their ends and also because it's funny. 
And Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, I think, were a perfect storm in terms mm -hmm. of if you, if you wanted to really rile people up, it was the perfect um, two. <laughs> the perfect two, right? Because you have Donald Trump, who, 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 who is, you know, essentially a chaos candidate. He's doing things that folks are high need for chaos, love and find funny. And Hillary Clinton is a perfect foil, <laughs> right? Um, you know, she's in, in a lot of ways, um, maybe, you know, could be considered overly serious and all this sort of stuff. The status but quo. I, I think we should also mention, yep, but we should also mention that her gender I think also mm -hmm. attracted, um, you know, if you think about Gamergate and these other, these, these other instances where I think we see people high need for chaos behaving in horrible ways, you know, turning that ire and that fire on women, I think is something that, um, for the for, for folks that are high on these kinds of, uh, dark traits, it's even more, uh, fun for them to do. So the 2016 election, I don't think was about. You know, this was the moment that folks high need for chaos were getting their political ideology met by Donald Trump. I think if Donald Trump were a Democrat, they would have done the same thing. And also the Clinton family itself, you know, is a good, they're a good example of how these things have been going on for a long time because people have been, oh, yeah. you know, spreading hostile political rumors about them for <laughs> their family Since for the 20, yeah. you know, 30 years, whatever. Uh, I mean, how many people yeah. have they killed? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, every, yeah, you know, so many, so many stories there. Uh, yeah. So, and I was going to say too, I mean, the, the focus on, you know, whose side is worse. Well, obviously we all have our beliefs about that. I think what I see happening here is a ramping up of the fact that the most angry and unreasonable people on both sides, you know, no matter who start, who we believe started it, they're both driving both things to ramp things up, you know, and, and it really feels like it, it is the way that the, the most nihilistic and, and tear it all down members of both sides seem to be having an undue an unusual amount of influence on, on ramping up the, uh, the divisions. At least that's what, how things seem to me these days. I, I think you're absolutely right. And they do it for different reasons, but it, it has the same outcome. And I can't remember his name, but some of what you're saying has reminded me of that. This guy, this theorist, um, social theorist who studied Beatles and then got into talking about how there will be an impending uh, destruction of society because modern society has created too many basically uh, people who want to seek being elites, but they can't actually become elites because there's not enough space for them. Do you know who I'm talking about? I can't remember his name off. I'm, I'm in the same boat as you are. I'm, I'm now familiar. Uh, I'm familiar with that argument, but I, I can't tell you who said that. A little note here. The person whose name I couldn't remember was Peter Turkin, T-U-R-C-H-I-N. If you're interested to learn more about his ideas, you can find an interesting piece about him in The Atlantic. He was kind of scoffed at, but I thought he made some good points uh, in seeing how there there can be this drive for uh, recognition, you know, that we see other people getting recognition around us, but yet society doesn't offer enough sl uh, spots for that recognition. So, so many people end up feeling slighted and feeling like, well, I'm, I just want to tear things down then. I mean, that's part of it. And I, I would sort of, you know, maybe also reframe that as... Part of, I think, what's going on, especially right now, one of the dynamics in the Western world is by trying to make hierarchies flatter um, and, and therefore allow you know, more diversity and more people to be who once before were considered, well, of course, on a, you know, lower on the social hierarchy. Once you sort of say, no, we're, we're, we're going to challenge sexism, we're going to challenge uh, racist ideologies, we're not going to accept these anymore. There's always going to be a group of people that say, well, folks that, uh, in this case, white men are going to say, well, that's where I get, you know, my status is from just being unquestionably in this higher part of the, hier uh, the hierarchy. Once you say it's open to more folks, then these people will, will feel slighted and marginalized, even if they're not necessarily really are. Um, but just because now it's not unquestionably the case that because you're a man um, or because you're white or because you're fill in the blank, you get X privileges. I, I think that's actually motivating a lot of this. Not 100 percent, but uh, I, from the data that we're looking at, you know, to the extent that that folks that are high need for chaos tend to be on the right. They are the type of person who says, you know, I basically want the world to be like it was 
before we talked about all this equality stuff. I think, uh, you know, one of the, from the conservative side, one of the more interesting arguments I've heard on that side was an interview between, uh, talk between Ezra Klein and conservative David French. And, you know, he, he espoused the conservative view that while, you know, the, the liberal side may be giving service to those ideas that from many conservatives' point of view, that's just being used to foster similar kinds of power dynamics and, and attempts to gain power. And that, that was an inter- really interesting talk, if anybody wants to hear that. It was one of the more interesting political discussions I'd heard, it, just from getting a sense of what it is that some of the you know, more reasonable conservatives uh, think on, on topics like that. I think part of what's going on there, too, is it really is a different uh, mentality. And so if... And, and sometimes these drive ideological differences. And so if, if you kind of have um, a worldview that, that things are zero sum, equality isn't really a thing, right? It's, you have a hierarchy and then there's just, it's just going to be a decide, we're just going to decide who's on the top and who's not on the top. And I think a lot of folks on the left, they tend to have a non-zero sum view of the world, um, which could be equally as sort of Pollyanna or, or you know, um, overly idealistic. Because, of course, you know, you can't have a fully flat organization either, right? Things have to get done and, and you have to have. And people do have a desire for getting above others, which always messes the equality thing up. Yeah, it always does. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So your study sheds a pretty dark and disturbing light on human nature and, and the current political environment. And, and one thing I sometimes wonder if there's something inherent in humans that we that it's very hard for us to achieve a stable, large group, and that it always seems to end up in some sort of bad outcome and us versus them uh, conflict. Do you think there's something to that, that modern society may in some way contain the seeds of its demise in, in allowing us to reach a point where we're not, not thinking as, as much about survival, that we're able to look around us and say, hey, this system is very unfair, you know, no matter who's saying that, because you can always say, you can always find elements of a system that are unfair in some way and, and lead to bad, bad outcomes, or look around you and say, these leaders are very fallible, making lots of mistakes. And I'm curious if you see, am I being too uh, negative, too pessimistic in, in, in seeing no, I, I, some I, of these dynamics? I don't think you are. And I, I think it's easy to be you know, a pessimist, especially in, in, in these times. And and I think that, you know, for, for me, um, I, I prefer to think about this as, as challenges or limitations uh, created by human psychology rather than kind of a deterministic thing where it says, well, you know, because humans have a particular bias, we can't get, get over it. But I will say one of the challenges that um, large-scale, diverse societies have always confronted is the fact that humans have a tendency to identify with groups and a, a desire to belong to groups that are distinctive in some way. So the, the social psychologist, Marilyn Brewer, who's done, you know, the, I, I think some of the, the most important and the most interesting work on social identities notes this, this sort of, um, in some sense, uh, opposing drives that are intention that the, the desire to belong to a group that has status and is, is powerful in some sense or, or, or real, well respected, but at the same time, one that is distinctive. And what that means is that there's some optimal size for how large our in-group can be. And it's difficult, therefore, for humans to say, you know, well, I'm just a human being, you know, uh, that's the group I belong to. Or I'm just a, I'm just a creature, right? I, I belong to all creatures are, are, are in my group, Mm -hmm. um, even folks on the left, right. Um, you know, we will see the world through the prisms of groups and will, you know, I see this on social media all the time. will do the things that humans do when they have, uh, when they're in competition with another group and, and that is to denigrate the opposing group, to treat them with a double standard. And to behave in ways that I think is, is destructive when you're trying to live together. Destructive even if you're trying to live side to side, right? It can, those are the things that lead to wars and, 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 and other horrible stuff. But that's a, the reason why that's a challenge for modern society, diverse modern societies, is that the hope of a democratic political system 
is that we can resolve our differences peacefully through elections, through reason, debate, and these sorts of things. That's all completely short-circuited when we are when we divide ourselves in a sectarian way, where we say, my group is the best thing, is always right, and is ex existentially threatened by some other group. When you find yourself, when societies find themselves in that place, what we see is that it's almost impossible to resolve that democratically. Uh, that, you know, sure, you can have an election, but if you lose the election, it's because the other side did something horrible and terrible and they cheated right. and... Very common pattern. Yep, and we need to go kill them, right? That's the thing that I, I worry about it, when I'm being pessimistic, is that social media, I don't necessarily think it's a cause of this, but it does allow us to fall into a sectarian pattern where we're only, where we don't just disagree or see ourselves, you know, different from another group of society, but we see them as the enemy and as evil incarnate. And therefore we can do anything uh, necessary to protect ourselves from them. That dynamic, which we see increasingly in the West, certainly in the United States, I think that's the biggest threat uh, us having, you know, kind of a stable uh, society uh, uh, that's diverse. I've had conservatives ask me what the worst thing about Donald Trump is, you know, in a genuine way, if they don't, because they just don't see it sometimes. And the number one thing I point to is just the division, you know, the, the creation of this. I mean, he's a good example of, of all of these things. He's a very representative of these us versus them dynamics. And he's fostered that so much in his speeches and emails and painting liberals as not real Americans and such, you know, all these kinds of things. And yeah, just a very good uh, example. So uh, well, there's a lot of other things we could talk about, but I think uh, I've probably taken enough of your time. You've done some very interesting work. Uh, you've written books about the effects of uh, cable TV uh, news, and, and you found that it wasn't as big as an effect as most people think. In fact, you thought that people uh, were, were largely polarized before watching cable news. So that looked very interesting. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a second about that book and how you see that. How I see this fitting into to social yeah. media. Yeah, it's that, you know, one of the things that I think um, that that book points to and, and um, that I found you know, over and over again in my research is that we make a mistake when we're thinking about the effects of media, when we treat people as if they're just passive receptacles of information. So if they see a media a post on Twitter, they're just going to believe it. That's, that's usually not the case. People are not that, that stupid. Instead, largely what we see is that when it comes to politics, first of all, not that many people are all that interested in politics or motivated to discuss it or to, to engage with it. So that's number one. It's a small slice of, of, of society, of, you know, that, of the polity that engages in this. Those folks already have opinions. Um, often very strong ones. And so largely uh, it's cable TV, you know, 15 years ago was sort of the Twitter of today, right? When people engage or, or, or receive information, uh, partisan information, they tend to put it through a filter, which is, does this agree either with my worldview if they're being sophisticated about it, or is this consistent with what my group, my political group thinks? You know, is this is what other Democrats or Republicans think, other liberals or conservatives think. And so those, those things, I think, are the, are the bigger problem. It's not necessarily um, partisan cable news or even rumors and misinformation now today that we're talking about on social media. It's about people's often inability to stop and be a bit reflective and second guess their own, you know, uh, intuitions and biases, those are actually, I think, a bigger deal um, and, and sort of creating this dynamic that we have. Um, and, and you've of, written of a book about as well. And you've written a book about that too, or the, the ability to step, take a step back and, and think about. That's the more optimistic work I've done. Although you could say the <laughs> pessimistic aspect is that it's also not that many people <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That, that habitually, I should say, tend to be reflective. But the, the, the silver lining there, I think, is that humans do have this capacity. It is one of the things that I think um, allowed 
human beings to become sort of the uh, an, an apex, you know, uh, animal, if you will, in 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 the in the ecosystem is the ability to to think and reason. I think that that this might be getting a little too broad and philosophical, but if you think about that, the idea for democracy and the idea of not just democracy, but a democracy in a broad, diverse society is something with its roots in the Enlightenment era. And so a lot of the philosophical under-support for, for democracy starts with the notion that people can reason and are enlightened enough to reason and come to decisions in a peaceful way, even when they disagree. I think that's true, but the, in, in some sense, the Enlightenment led us to, to maybe think that, I think it led many people to think that it's just something that is inevitable, that we're, we're constantly moving forward, we're getting more educated, we're getting more tolerant, et cetera, et cetera. I think there is something to that, but that doesn't mean that we've left behind us the dark ages. That's always going to be with us. Those mentalities are always going to be with us. The sort of um, the drive to want the world to be a simple place where you're always right and your group is always right, that's just always going to be with us. And so I think the challenge for, for modern society and for democracies is how can we get more people to stop and push against their own comfort zones. Uh, I, I think right now we're in a, in, a, in a dark place because, as you say, when you put people in a context where they're just yelling at each other, um, it, they're not going to, you know, even the most thoughtful person is going gonna, is gonna to get angry and, and fire off some, some ill-thought things. Yeah, and it could be that there's some structure, some societal uh, you know, government structure that prevents these things better from happening, you know, like, People talk about the ranked voting things and, and there's, you know, it's, it's entirely possible that we're just in the U S anyway, are, are in a, and that many people are in structures that foster these, these worst outcomes. And then that there's some structures that would be, would do a better job at preventing those outcomes, whatever those structures may be. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think, you know, that, that is a problem in the United States is having it, the, the two party system. Once you get into this sort of like, uh, you know, Lily Mason has done done work on this. You know, when, once once people sort of completely stack their their social identities so that they completely align with one political side or the other, you, you get into this sectarian mindset where it's it's us versus them. In a multi party system, you you're less likely to have that kind of dynamic. Nonetheless, you know, um, I'm living here in France right now, and you know, it's a multi party system, but you see some of the similar dynamics. Largely, though, because again. You can boil things. You can always try to boil things down to us versus them. You know, it's you know, French who, people who are French versus um, new new arrivals who are not playing by the rules. Um, so you know, you can always uh, create a world in which there's there's just two groups that that hate on each other. But I do agree with you that the political system in the United States just allows that to be amplified and harnessed in a sense for political gain. And that's the most difficult thing to address, right? If once you have a political party that can can reliably attract votes by stoking those divides, what well, those divides are going to get stoked. All right, this has been a great talk. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. That was Kevin Arsenault. His last name is spelled A R C E N E A U X. You can find his research and books by searching for his name online, and you can find his website that way too. If you like this episode, you might like some past interviews I did on related topics. I interviewed Jennifer McCoy about how extreme polarization dynamics tend to work. I also interviewed Jamie Settle, who researched how Facebook may be amplifying our divides and animosity. And I talked to Karina Kurostalina about how insults and hurt feelings play a role in political conflicts. And I have a few other ones in the backlog that are related to social media and polarization, but those are some of the most relevant. If you want to read my piece on how social media may be dividing us, you can search online for Zachary Elwood Social Media Polarization and find it. You can learn more about this podcast and my work at behavior-podcast.com. And that's probably the best way to reach me if you want to write me. I make no money from this podcast and spend a good amount of time on it. If you'd like to show some financial appreciation, you can go to my website, behavior-podcast.com to get my Patreon link or contact me for my PayPal info. If you want to show other forms of appreciation, 
I appreciate any shares of this podcast on social media. And I appreciate ratings on iTunes, as that's the most popular podcast platform. Thanks for listening. Music by Small Skies. Mm-hmm.